Hi, everybody. How are you? Can you guys hear us okay? Great. My name is Margaret Wunderlich. Um, I'm the business manager for uh, everything but the house. And I have Erica Holy Cross here with me. She is um, ISA certified, certified appraiser and the um, Columbus operations manager for everything but the house. We have a warehouse located over in Hilliard. Um, our company is based in Cincinnati. And I'm gonna be talking to you guys. We're both gonna be talking to you guys today about um, selling at auction. And we're going to start out with a game. So you guys can keep score and the winner gets nothing but bragging rights. Maybe. Help. Oh, there we go. Oh no, you saw the, there we go. Well, now you saw the answer, but um, this is a game called what's the winning bid. And so you can guess what these items sold for at auction. This is an assortment of vintage fishing lures, $54, $146 or $205. You're geniuses. Ceramic tabletop Christmas tree. How many of you guys have this at home? $160. Mid-century modern sofa. This is leather and I will give you a hint. It's by a, it's by a nice Brazilian designer. So Let's see, yes. The chairs to this set sold for like 3,900, I believe. 1988 Michael Jordan basketball card. B, $326. LG front load washer dryer. Nineteen hundred. Graduated natural pearl and diamond necklace. Fourteen thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Nineteen seventy three Toyota FJ forty Land Cruiser. Yep. Who won? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone go home and tell all your friends you won. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about defining value. Um, you might have some things at home in your family, um, curious what they're worth. Um, and there are three different types of value um, that you might have in your head. Um, first is your personal assigned value. This has to do with your sentimental value, all your family memories, um, maybe the original price you paid back in the day. Um, that is a certain type of value. And it's important to note that is your personal assigned value and it really has nothing to do with the other two types of value. Appraisal value, which is the replacement value, the insurance value, you might have ha had to get appraisals on certain things in your home to insure them. And then there's the fair market value, which is what it's gonna sell for today, right now. Um, and that is always changing. Fair market value is what we're primarily going to talk about, um, and that's what you are going to expect to see when you sell things at auction. A lot of things factor into fair market value, um, style trends, uh, nostalgia of whatever generation is shopping at the moment, um, supply chain and material cost, and then um, what your audience is like. 
Um, this, like I said, this value is always changing. So it's important to reevaluate what that fair market value is in the moment that you are calculating it. Anything to add, Erica? Um, yeah, so I would say um, one of the things that I've noticed in looking at fair market value of pieces is that it does change pretty quickly. So it can change, it can change from year to year, it can change like within the month. We were just talking just recently how um, we've been watching uh, things like um, hand knit blankets. So hand knit blankets from like maybe like the early 20th century, just really beautiful, nicely crocheted pieces that about a year or even two years ago, we're going for $5, you know, $10 are now the cost is going up. We've watching it go to $50, $60. So we're watching that trend. I don't know where that trend's coming from, but it's watching that trend because it's really interesting to see that. And then when we're like, for instance, when we're at everything but the house and we're doing lotting, we're thinking about that, how well it's gonna sell on its own versus together with another piece. So we're always watching how that works. Um, and also in terms of nostalgia, the things that are trending today are going to be the collectors of today, people who are, you know, really interested in collecting um, generally as a larger group. So for instance, and again, we were just talking about this, um, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, lunch boxes were selling, they were huge. They were selling for so much money. And those same lunch boxes today do not have the same value because the collector, the collectors are different now. So that nostalgia piece. So for instance, you know, people who were collecting maybe were my age a little bit years ago. And that was something from their past, from their childhood that they were really interested in. And now people who are collecting today, some of that larger group of collectors aren't necessarily as interested in those pieces because it's not a part of their childhood or their lore or whatever, so. And Pokemon cards are the hot thing right now. At least they have been for the last like 12 to eight months. And well, that might not last so long. There's, it's hard to say, but there's always crazes like that. Um, and just because it had a craze doesn't mean that that craze is still going on. So mid-century modern, also like mid-century modern, of course, right now is, is so huge pieces that 20 years ago were selling for, you know, $20, $30 at the thrift store. You know, those same pieces are $500, $600. Um, whereas things like Victorian furniture, which was so collectible, the, the prices on Victorian furniture has really gone down quite a bit. So it's interesting to watch those trends. So when you're looking at items in your collection or um, in a family member's collection um, and you're trying to evaluate it, um, it's important to um, look at a couple different things. First of all, your market. Um, are you wanting to sell this um, on a local level, at a local consignment shop, at a garage sale, um, on Facebook Marketplace? Are you looking to sell it um, at more of like a regional or national auction house? Is this going to be listed online, um, on the internet where lots of people can get to it? Um, what is your market like? And then define the item. You need to find out uh, the brand name, if there is one, how old it actually is, um, the condition, is it scratched up? Is it missing parts? Um, what's the material? Is there a pattern, model, et cetera? It's really important to define um, as thoroughly as you can that item before you start researching so that you know what to search for. Uh, then you're going to want to look at how this item has sold recently. Um, a couple different sites you can use for that. eBay is usually the number one that people will search for, but you want to make sure that you're looking for sold prices, not ask prices, because that's different. You need to look for some, what it actually sold for, and preferably in the past year if you can. Um, EBTH, our own site, is um, all of our past auction records are public. You just need to use the search bar and click ended items. And then you can sort by recently ended and you can see what similar items have sold um, in the last month, year, couple years. If it's a really specialized item, sometimes you have to go back a few years. But um, if you can get something from the last couple months, that's always because fair market value can shift even within a three to six month period. Anything to add? 
So we talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to go over a few marks that we're seeing. Um, and these are just a couple of um, sales from the past few months to kind of give you an idea of what's hot and what's not uh, on the market right now. So we have um, painting over here um, from about 1860, um, has a gorgeous frame. Um, and that sold for four hundred and twenty-five dollars. Um, this off-the-graph, um, I don't see any addition on there. Um, it, it Pat Buckley Buckley Moss, forty dollars. Offset lithographs are typically lower value, and especially if it's not like signed in addition print, um, prints are going to be a little tough to sell. of a like changing in the fair market value. I don't know those of you that are familiar with the P. Buckley Moss prints that maybe five years ago they were selling, at least on our site, they were selling for over a hundred dollars, but now they're selling much lower. Again, another original artwork um, with uh, a you know established artist. And um, we have the title, we have the date um, that sold for over $5,000 with us. Um, now we have some paintings uh, that are just no name, no date, no title, um, and they're not framed. So um, we can see the value on those is significantly less. Um, signed first edition books are things that are uh, definitely collectible, um, particularly certain authors and genres. This is a first edition Norman Rockwell book from 1960. Um, with everything but the house, we do third party authentication on all of our autographs through JSA. So um, you know that when you're buying an autograph through us, it is certified authentic. Um, and that helps us get good auction values for signed pieces. Um, these copper dipped uh, keepsake baby shoes are not popular right now. Um, pretty much any baby related item, to be honest, is very difficult to sell. Um, even things like cribs or even contemporary baby items, um, the regulations on those items change a lot. And so if it, they change like almost week to week, it seems. So if you are trying to resell a baby item, a company like us, we can't sell it unless it's truly antique because it's not within regulation. Um, and just kind of baby stuff in general, people prefer to buy new and it's not a good thing to sell on auction. Here's another autographed um, signed photo of the Sopranos cast that sold very well. Um, these little collectible bells um, or any other kind of knickknack, if it's these types of brands, precious moments, um, those are not valuable brands. Uh, a lot of people, I think, purchase some of these things with the thought that they were valuable. Um, and unfortunately right now they're not, doesn't mean they don't have fond memories for you. It just means that you can't really get money out of them when selling at auction. Any other brands off the top of your head that you see collected a lot that, um, I mean, Beanie Babies are another one. Um, Hummels. I'm sure many of you have Hummels. I know my grandmother had a huge collection. Um, while they're adorable, they don't tend to be worth very much at all, especially the later editions, but even the ones that are older don't have the value that they did even five years ago, 10 years ago. So that's one of the ones. I would also say to you, a lot of things that are collector, like if it says collector on it, it's probably does not have very much value. And not, it's not, that's a generalization, of course, but like the collector plates and those kinds of things, coins collect 
collector coins. So if it says collector, it's very likely not something that's going to have a lot of value. That's not always true. So don't take me to the bank on that one, but generally it is. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, fashion items, at least at EBTH, fashion items are very, very popular things to sell. Um, and they do, they can do very well. Um, things like Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Hermes, I mean, those high-end brands actually hold their value very well. Um, and we authenticate those pieces and get excellent um, values for them on our site. Everyday knit type pieces, um, things that men's store brands, those really should be donated. Um, you can't get very much money out of those. Even if you take them to a local consignment shop, it's really pennies. Um, so it's a good excuse to buy the really nice brands because you know they have good resale value. <laughs> Furs are something um, that we do sell and we sell them a lot. The best time to sell your furs is between like January and March, I would say. Um, that's when we get the best values for our furs. Um, and we are still selling them. They are still selling very well. I will say I have a lot of people come to me with furs that they had insured for 15, 20 grand at one point. And you're not going to see that type of value out of your furs, um, but you can get several hundred or even several thousand dollars out of your furs if they're in good condition and we sell them at the right time of year. Wedding dresses, on the other hand, um, pretty much never sell well. That's a very custom item. Um, they just don't photograph great either. And the styles, again, change minute by minute. So unfortunately, while your great, great grandma's wedding dress is probably gorgeous, um, it's not something that you're going to get much value uh, on auction for. Anything to add there? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Erica mentioned this, but uh, mid-century modern furniture pretty much always does well. It doesn't even have to be Eames or any sort of really high-end designer. Um, it can just be in that style. Um, Mid-century modern style across the board performs well. Um, entertainment centers, on the other hand, are definitely, I think they've, they're, they've passed on their way out. They are out. Um, people mount their TVs now. Their TVs are three times the size as the little box in the entertainment center allows. Um, and I know that entertainment centers at one time were very expensive. Right now, donation places won't even take them. So they have to be trashed, which is really unfortunate. If you can repurpose it, um, I've seen a lot of people repurpose them into bars, which is really fun. But um, Unfortunately, any sort of entertainment center or even a TV stand is not going to be selling very well right now. And probably ever, I would say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, Victorian furniture is another thing that is just not in vogue right now. Um, I think it's really pretty. I love it. I have it in my house, but... Um, the general market is not willing to pay very much for Victorian furniture right now. I would say like those nice carved marble top vanities, 100 to 150 bucks um, for those, which I know at one point they were 10 times that. So um, just so you have an idea. Brand names like Henrodon or um, you know, other types of high-end brands those still hold their value. And while style does make a difference, um, the brand is really important when it comes to furniture. Um, this kind of really classic um, federal style, this particular type of federal style it has marquetry in it. Um, a piece like this can sell for thousands of dollars, as you see. Condition is something that you really have to look at with furniture too. Um, 
Erica, I think you can back me up on this. We see a lot of furniture that comes in that has broken leg or it's missing knobs or sometimes it's not even obvious. You start to move the furniture and actually that leg has been detached for 25 years and it was just sitting on it and you didn't know. Um, and moving a furniture can be tricky too. So just keep that in mind. Um, if it is broken in any way, the value goes down pretty much to zero. So I'll talk a little bit about EBTH. Um, we are a full surface online auction platform. We do estate and consignment services. Um, and we handle things from start to finish. So we are going to evaluate your item. We're going to do any sort of authentication that needs to happen. We're going to list it. We're going to pack it, ship it, and send you a check. Um, we sell up to 40,000 items every month on our site. It is completely online. Um, and we have 19 different categories. So like you saw at the beginning, we sell cars, we sell holiday decor, and everything in between. We have a global audience of almost 3 million um, registered bidders. And we also have our own show on HGTV that Erica stars in. Just... <laughs> <laughs> she's on like she's on the crew but yeah the second season of that's going to be coming out this year i believe so you can keep an eye on that we um really take the effort out of selling your items because we do start to finish evaluate what it is you might have something you have no idea what it is we'll find out um we will catalog it we will do professional photography we will list it online we will market it with social media with google advertising we'll send email blasts and notifications to our buyers um, and we will pack and ship the item we will deal with the customer um, and we will send you your check we have in-house and third-party um, authentication that takes place. So Erica manages our team here in Columbus. We use third-party authentication processes. We also have specific people in-house who deal with coins, who deal with stamps, who deal with vehicles. Um, and we always make sure everything passes through several sets of eyes before it goes live on our site. We have a really wide reach, a global audience. Um, our audience is educated. They're really engaged. We do a lot of promotional um, writing and video content to educate our buyers on you know, specific artists, specific collectors. Um, and we have a, a long exposure of typically five days, but up to 10 days for higher end items. So it's not um, just who shows up to your tag sale that day. It's on for several days and gets a lot of exposure. We have a really quick turnaround and a prompt payment system. So you do get your items turned around and paid within um, usually about 60 days is when you'll from drop off to when your checks in hand could be quicker, um, could be a little longer depending on if the item takes a lot more authentication. But um, it's a great service for zero effort and a quick turnaround. The process of selling with EBTH is pretty simple. Um, number one is to talk to me. Um, I kind of vet the items for Central and Northern Ohio and beyond. Um, so I have cards over there. My contact information is at the end of the slides too. Um, call me, text me. Let me know what you have. I'm happy to come out to your property and take a look um, and see if your items would be a good fit to sell with us. Um, we will sign a contract and this says these items belong to me. I have the legal right to sell them. I'm giving EBTH that right to auction these items um, and it goes over our um, commission structure and all of that. We do take a cut of every item that sells. Um, and that is a sliding scale based on the price of the item. So that's something that I can send you if you get in touch with me. We will set up a time for you to drop off to our warehouse in Hilliard or for a pickup truck to come out and, and pick up at your place. Um, and then you just watch your seller dashboard on your EBTH account. 
watch the photography happen, watch the bidding happen, watch the sale happen and watch your check come in the mail. Just a few things that um, we're always looking for. Coins and stamps are something that make um, our sellers a lot of money because you probably have a box full of them laying around the house and um, you never know what could be in there. Coins are very, very hot right now and selling very well with us. Jewelry and watches are another thing that everyone has a box of family jewelry watches and it might just be all costume even then we can sell it and we do get really good values for costume jewelry um but you never know i've had a lot of people bring me what they thought was a box full of costume jewelry that was actually all gold and diamonds and then they just made 20 grand so it it can be worth getting some eyes on it that know um, what to look for and can kind of give you an idea of value and i do that all the time come out to people's homes look at their massive jewelry collection, let them know what they've got, um, and then, you know, sell the pieces that they want to get rid of. Name brand fashion, houseware items, even like cookware, like your KitchenAid mixer, um, your La Crusade cookware, um, that is valuable and can be sold. Um, quality original art, furniture in good condition, um, good brand and in a style that is desirable right now, like mid-century modern. This is my contact information, and I wanted to see if you guys had any questions. We can also pull up the EVTH website and um, can I show you guys how to navigate it a little bit? Um, Erica, do you want to talk a little bit about um, appraisal and kind of fair market value and how you can use EVTH to look that up. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, as I was studying appraisal, so I've been doing appraisal for a while, and then I decided to go ahead and get a certification just to kind of have the credentials and to learn the extra pieces and parts. Um, and one of the things that I discovered through that is that um, everything but the house is used for by a lot of appraisers to determine fair market value for different items, which is really exciting to hear that. that um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have such an incredible staff um, of experts. We have so many we have so many people in Columbus and also in Cincinnati in our main area who are we have experts in pretty much every area. So um, it's really exciting. Like I know in the Columbus market, we have people who are experts in art. Some people are experts in prints and multiples, others in painting. We have a fashion expert. Um, and I know I just was down in Cincinnati last week, which was really, really fun to be down there. And I was able to take a tour of the, we have a whole gemology department, which is its own separate building. So we have gemologists on staff. So we're able to verify and we're able to, um, and we're known in the industry as people who are able to, you know, determine what the things are, the items are, and to list them properly. And we guarantee that we're listing them properly. So that is in part through our own experts, but also through third-party authentication when we need it, especially for things like um, autographs and that sort of thing. So um, I think that's a really exciting, I think that's a really exciting piece um, of being able to look at our site to say, like, honestly, that those are fair market value prices for the most part that we're able to get for your items. So this is ebth.com and you can browse um, by category, by sale, um, by what's ending, by what's popular and by what's featured. Um, would you click on categories for me? You can exit out of that. You do not have to have an account to use our website. Um, you do to buy something. Um, but here you can search um, all different types of categories. And this is going to show you what's live right now on the site for sale. If you want to look at something that's ended, which is how you can kind of determine what value your items have, uh, the best thing to do is to go to the search bar at the top and to type something in. So who has an item that they are thinking about um, that they're curious of the value? Anybody? Great, perfect example. So I would type in um, first edition Sports Illustrated.
And will we type will we type out firsts or use the number? I think we would type out firsts. Um, sometimes you have to. So like if you search couch on EBTH, you're not going to find anything. You've got to search sofa. Um, so that's something to note. Um, you can try as is. So there's nothing live right now, but if you go down um, to ended items on show only, which is on the left side of the screen, click ended. Um, looks like there's just a couple. I bet we need to type out firsts. Yeah, that's um, I think when we sort by recently ended up there in the top right hand corner. Piano. Pianos are really tough to sell. Um, if we're going to sell them, they've got to be an in home pickup item because they're just too hard to move. We don't sell ivory of any kind. Um, we do not touch ivory. Um, right now, we are not selling Playboy magazines. We have sold them a lot in the past. Right now, we are not selling them. Um, we don't sell puffer fish, which I learned. Um, we don't sell um, certain types of like sand dollars or it's it's all regulation. There's a lot of regulations on that type of stuff. We don't sell any, any, we don't sell any Nazi memorabilia and we also don't sell black Americana. Yeah, if we determine that's the messaging or the content of something, perhaps um, an outdated Dr. Seuss book has um, terminology or content that's against our brand standards, we won't sell it. Um, so yep. that's a little bit up to our discretion, but just keep that in mind. I'm not sure that I'm not seeing anything. <laughs> I don't see anything that's actually uh, Sports Illustrated. Maybe we should just look search Sports Illustrated. Yeah, I would so there's one that's live can we look at the ended ones over on the left hand side one of the things too i want to I, I would mention is when you're watching the auctions, this is something I, when I was in the estates, I used to tell people like it's, you'll, you'll want to watch the auction, right? So you have something up, you'll start on the first day and you might get like five, $10 bids and then nothing happens for several days. And you're watching it every 10 minutes and getting really anxious. I would say the majority of the action takes place in that last hour. So, you know, and that's true for, especially for a lot of different things like Art, art bidders tend to art to bid at the last minute. Jewelry and coins is also like that. So I just wanted to share that. So I, cause I heard a gasp at the $3, mm -hmm. but that may not be where it ends. I was shopping for uh, jewelry last night and this really beautiful ring that I wanted that was 60 or 70 bucks sold for, I think $900. Yeah, I was out of the, I was out of the game on that one pretty early. <clears throat> So a first edition Sports Illustrated, I would think that that would be pretty valuable. Um, I see some signed Sports Illustrated. Right here, 393. There you go. Would you mind clicking, do you mind clicking on that listing for us? So that's sold April 13th, 2022. So that's nice and recent. Um, love that. So that's a good, that's a good value. If that had sold in like 2016, then I would say, mm, I don't feel comfortable telling you that's accurate. So this is a good um, example of how we list items, all the different condition notes, dimensions. There's several photographs. Oh no. <laughs> 
We do have a, we have a team of editors who go through everything, but of course you can imagine they might miss a word or two. So um, they go through and they make sure that the content is correct. So we have like several eyes on the same pieces, but every now and then a typo. <laughs> Found it immediately. <laughs> because if you found it immediately, someone else probably saw it also. And so, you know, it's those things and um, it's just really important to us to get it right on. But again, human error, it's going to happen. Anybody have anything else they want us to search for? Yeah. Cool. Beatles memorabilia, I mean, stuff like that is, it can be either really valuable or not at all. Um, <clears throat> I have sold some Beatles memorabilia that was just kind of general memorabilia, which that might fall into that category that I was a little disappointed and, you know, it brought maybe 60, 70 bucks. Um, but like if their records and stuff do really, really well, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So does well it just it depends on what the item is those are going to be really item specific like how scarce that item is or what the materials are it's made of that sort of thing if it's just a general picture of the beetles in the necklace i think that's going to be a little bit hard to determine the era that it actually was from um if it was like a magazine featuring the beetles um did you bring it send us a picture of it Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we? we sold a number of Roman Johnson pieces here. In fact, we actually sold a large mural to the um, museum. So, um, uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, go ahead and type it in. So, Roman Johnson. Mm -hmm. Sorry, type what you said? Roman Johnson. I think that's, I think you just type in Roman Johnson, it should be fine. And then... So if you scroll down, you'll see the mural. There's the Can you mural. sort by recently ended? Thank you. That is very important to do. You don't wanna be looking at records from that are really old. So this is an interesting story about the Roman Johnson mural. We actually went out to a house. There was a house out in um, Plain City, out near the Plain City area. And it was a collector and his family had no idea how much he'd collected because he had stopped letting people into his home. Um, but he was collecting all manner of art. He had a, a very large pole barn in the back. And after he passed away, they opened up the pole barn and it was like floor to ceiling. Um, there were all kinds of hearsts. There were all kinds of, um, there was everything in artwork. And he had bought several pieces from Roman Johnson's studio. And that was part of it. This mural down here that the museum purchased, um, that one was rolled up in the basement of the house under a whole bunch of stuff. And then Roman Johnson's um, easel was in there, his paint stand. There was so much stuff that was there um, that nobody even knew was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't have, make those public, but the majority of our buyers, like 60% are female and they um, are, I think, age 50 to 65. But um, yeah, we, we really do have a wide, um, a wide range of bidders. And uh, obviously we've got a lot here in Ohio, but um, definitely a lot of national buyers. I mean, I think in general, yes, if you're to walk into the home of a 35-year-old versus a home 
of um, a 30, you know, a 35 year old in 1995, 1995, they probably had a lot more knickknacks and like that type of stuff. But I do think that like the millennial generation is buying a lot of fashion, right? They're buying a lot of, um, uh, what, what's else? I mean, they might be buying some sort of collectible things. They're definitely buying technology. So um, and I think they are buying furniture for their home. They're probably not buying figurines. They're probably not buying China. Um, and that's, you do see the market be pretty low on those types of things. They're not buying Victorian furniture. Um, as you can see, the market on that's pretty low. So, but like, you know, Louis Vuitton and Gucci is through the roof. They're buying that stuff. So, and mid-century modern furniture or really contemporary um, industrial styles of furniture. So I think that that generation is buying. They're just specific about what they are buying. Um, and you know, things like China and crystal and that stuff, the market is down. Yeah. So I have worked with a lot of national um, clients. We even have na international clients. Um, it's, the first step is definitely to evaluate what you have. Um, if the value is low, it is not worth bringing it to Ohio to process and sell. Um, logistics are also a cost. So what I do a lot is... Like, just yesterday, I was working with a family in West Virginia who has a whole estate worth of stuff to sell. I went through, I priced it all out. I said, here's our logistics cost. Here's what I'm anticipating that you're going to make. And I do think this project is worth it and you're going to still make a profit. So I can help you determine that um, if it's going to be worth the logistics of bringing it in. But absolutely, especially small stuff, it's really easy to FedEx. And we have people FedEx stuff in from all over the globe. So sterling silver is always valuable. Um, silver plate is pretty much worthless. Um, there, sometimes I can get a couple hundred dollars out of a silver flat silver plate flatware set if it's the right brand and style. Um, I sometimes can get a couple hundred dollars out of a silver plate tea set if it's really, really nice and fanciful and clean. Um, but sterling silver is a whole different ball game. And if it truly is sterling silver, a tea set, a flatware set, thousands of dollars. If it's Tiffany & Co., it could be tens of thousands of dollars. Also, just a reminder to you that the silver tea sets, if you're not aware, sometimes they forgot the little warmers, the, um, uh, not warmers, what are they called? The ivory, they have the little ivory pieces. So if they have an ivory piece in it, we won't be able to sell it. So that's happened before where someone's had this beautiful sterling silver tea set, but we can't sell it because it has the little ivory pieces in it. So. I see a lot of that um, are in my day to day. And I will say we sometimes can remove the ivory on your sterling tea set. I've done that before. We can remove it. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, for some reason, a lot of people uh, were over in Asia, um, you know, at maybe during, um, you know, for military service or something like that, um, missionary service. And they collected a lot of Asian art, Asian collectibles, furniture, what have you. And they brought it back. Um, and I see a lot of that. Um, some of it can be valuable, but I would say overall as a blanket statement, it's pretty middle of the road. Um, and certain, um, certain pieces are not worth a lot. So certain pieces are, so it kind of as a, as a blanket statement, I would say middle of the road, but, um, I'd be interested to see specifically what piece it is. Um, we get a lot of just kind of like paintings on silk or like washes or watercolors. Um, prints are always kind of fun. Like woodblock prints are fun, but Mm hmm Cloisonne always does really, really well. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's totally free for me to 
do a consultation with you. Um, that's what I do all day long. We can do that virtually. We can do that over at your place. You can bring items to our warehouse in Hillier to meet with me. Um, that's totally free. Um, there's no fee to consign your items with us. We just take a percentage. If we send movers out to your home and pack everything up for you and bring them to our warehouse, there is a fee to cover the cost of the movers. And that's completely dependent on how much stuff you have. Um, if I'm doing a 6,000 square foot home, selling every item in the home, it's going to take me a week to pack it up. Um, it's probably going to be $2,000 for that. If it's just one day, quick stop, pack up out of there, it's probably closer to just a couple hundred dollars, but it's the cost of movers essentially. And you're welcome to pay your own movers to bring stuff to us if you'd rather. answer that question. So um, we do our best to authenticate and guarantee everything that we have, but we do, there are times where even we're fooled, our experts are fooled, and that has happened before. That's happened with a jewelry piece where we thought it was one thing, but then to find out it was something else. It does not happen very often, but when it does happen, we offer a credit. So we stand by what we sell. So it's not kind of a, it's not one of those buyer beware situations. I know that there are some auction houses that are like that. I've purchased from them too, where they're like, we think it's this thing. <laughs> so hopefully it's that thing, you know, but we, if we've set it online, if we misrepresent something, um, we will either give a, we'll give a credit of some kind or, you know, do something to make it right. And you will see our listings are extremely thorough for that reason. Um, a lot of people who sell with me, why are they listing every little nick and every speck of dust? Um, it's just really important that we're very thorough and honest with our listings. It's not going to affect the sales price. That There's a couple of nicks, but it is important to us that we list things um, truthfully and honestly. Most of our silver sells for over melt value. Um, so that tells me that they are buying it and using it. Um, but I will say a lot of times people think they have sterling and it's actually silver plate. Um, sterling, true sterling silver is not common. Um, I don't see it in every home. That's a great question. The first thing I do is look at the back of a fork or a spoon, um, and there's going to be some really tiny writing on there. So use a magnifying glass, use a loop if you need to. Um, but if it is sterling, it will say sterling 99% of the time. If it says Rogers, if it says EP, um, that's plated. Also for um, for silver, for European silver, it's not necessarily gonna say sterling, it's gonna have a mark. Um, and then you'll have to look at the marks. There's certain marks that will determine that it's sterling. So there's German marks and English marks um, that you'll wanna, you can look up online. They have whole, um, uh, uh, um, what's the word? I'm, yeah, they have like, they'll have like a whole place where you can look and see all the marks for those. Majority of what I see is um, English and like or American um, brands, and so that will say sterling on it. If you start seeing like square stamps that are just pictorial marks, that is something that's from the UK, and then you'd want to look up those pictorial marks to see if it is sterling.
Exactly. That's a great question. So we do still do estates. I mean, we probably are doing like maybe one or two estate sales a week, I would say on our site, something like that. Um, but a lot of people, um, they just have a car full of stuff to sell. Maybe they're bringing us stuff every week, um, just to clear out their home. Um, a true estate sale only works when it's uh, a, a good amount of items and it's a well-rounded sale with furniture, art, decor, um, you know, collectibles, a good range of categories. And so if the items you have don't meet those um, specifications, they're going to be put into a curated sale. And we do really fun curated sales around colors, holidays, specific categories. We always do a May the 4th be with you sale, which is really fun of Star Wars items. So um, the, it's not to say that one is more successful than the other. It's just a different way of marketing your items. Um, and it's completely dependent on what works best for you and your situation and your group of things. We are not going to hold on to your fur if you bring it in now until December. Um, that would be something I'd say you can sell it with us now or you can just wait and sell it with us in December and you'll probably make more if you wait and sell with us in December. But that's up to you. Um, from the time you bring your items in, it's usually 30 to 60 days for them to go online. Um, jewelry and watches does take longer because it's a longer authentication process. Um, and certain items, again, if they're really high value, if they just take a long time to evaluate, autographs sometimes take a while. It just takes time um, before it goes live. And you know, if it's an item that needs to go in one of our landmark sales, for example, which is a high-end sale, those only happen quarterly. So it might be a couple months before another one of those sales is coming up. Yeah. I mean, we work with artists directly to sell their work. Um, we have lots of consignment partners who sell with us and drop off to us on a weekly basis. That can be artists, that can be collectors, that can be people who have an antique store or another type of business. They just have inventory, um, jewelry manufacturers. Um, lots of people in those industries sell with us regularly. They use us as an avenue to um, sell and market their inventory um, and they make a lot of money doing it. So uh, it's a great uh, partnership for a lot of businesses and artists alike. Um, I do find that when working with artists, um, I love to give things a try with a couple pieces first because not all artists perform well at auction. Um, but we've had artists like this individual from Atlanta who was selling his work for really low prices, tried a few pieces out with us on EBTH and they sold really, really well. And now he pretty much exclusively sells with us because we get great prices for his work. So it is very dependent um, on the type of art and the artists and how they do their own marketing in conjunction with ours. Um, but I would love to, if it, there's artists who want to sell with us, um, work with me so I can make sure your art gets put in a, a particular sale and we market it correctly um, so that we really get do it a good service. Yeah, if you're looking for something on our site, um, if you're collecting a certain thing, you can create a save search. So you can type something in the search bar and then save the search and you will get a notification, an email or a pop-up on your phone. It says, we have new items in your save search category. So if you're looking for a Model T, um, we sell Model Ts actually a couple times a year. So you'll get a notification when a Model T is coming up for sale. So you don't have to just search every day, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay.
That's a great question. Um, I get a lot of people with things um, that are maybe a little damaged and it's like, do I spend the money to get this repaired? Um, definitely run that by somebody first um, and maybe have them run up an estimate for you of what they think it would sell for so that you know you're still going to make a profit. Um, I know like if I see a rug or something and they're like, oh, I'll get this professionally cleaned and then sell it. So I'm always like, ah, if it's going to cost you $500 to get that professionally cleaned, I don't think you're going to make your money back um, or it's going to eat so far into your profits that it's not worth it. Um, some furniture items that can be worth getting repaired, but some not. So it just is really dependent. And when I, I usually would come up with an estimate for what I think it would sell for if it were repaired and then get a quote for the repair and see how that's going to eat into your profits. So we have two processing locations, Columbus and Cincinnati. Um, when you are shopping on our site, it'll tell you where the location of the item is and um, you can get it shipped to you or we just started, um, now we will transfer it for you. There is a small fee for us to transport it for you up to Columbus if you wanna pick it up here um, or vice versa. Um, so just pay attention to that when you're shopping where the items are located um, and uh, Logistically, a sale is usually one location. So if it's a any sort of sale you're shopping, every item in that sale is in one single location. So if I have an item in Columbus, but I want it in the May the 4th sale, and the May the 4th sale is Cincinnati-based items, I will have it sent down to Cincinnati to be in that sale. That's at no cost to you for the seller. That's just really a log logistical thing on our side. Um, but that's why you'll see different items be in different locations. I get that question a lot. Um, it is really rare that something gets zero bids on our site. I feel like it happens maybe a couple times a year. Um, it's very, very rare because we have so many bids, bidders. Um, the worst case scenario is not that it, it doesn't sell. It's that it sells for a low dollar amount. It sells for $12. You know, that's the worst case scenario. And in that case, the buyer gets it. We do not set reserves. Um, so you need to be comfortable with that. It, the market's going to pay what the market's going to pay. And that buyer got your item for $12. If for some reason it truly doesn't sell or what's more likely is our curators look at it and they say, this is not going to sell well with us. We don't want to sell it then we can donate it for you or you can come pick it up, but you do need to pick it up um, relatively promptly. We don't like holding on to things for two years. So if you can get it in the next couple of weeks, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we're absolutely happy to do that for you and hold your item for another week so you don't have to make multiple trips. Um, there's a number at the very bottom of our website that you can call. Um, there's also an email. It's just contact at ebth.com um, and they will help you. It could take 24 hours for them to get back to you, but um, there's always a grace period and we, we send scary emails auto automatically, but we're not trying to throw away your items. We don't want to do that. Um, and I know at least here in Columbus, we hold on to your items and we try to contact you before we forfeit them. Um, we really don't like doing that. So yeah, absolutely can be done. The information is just at the very bottom of the website. Also, if you're struggling to reach someone, just call me, take one of my cards, call me, text me, and I'll make sure you get in touch with the right person. Yeah. So we post new items every day, um, 24, seven, 365. Um, they go live usually like at two or three in the morning and our sales end, um, like between seven and 10 at night. Um, and we, let's see, I, I would say it's pretty much equal as to what goes live and ends on every day of the week. Um, 
and we do, we, we, our pipeline is constant. Um, and we do somewhere between 20 and 40,000 items every month. So that equals out to about a thousand items a day. Anything to add on that, Erica? Um, yeah, I know that processing wise, in terms of from an operation standpoint, we process about 1500 items a day. So. It's the way that we operate as a company and it's our unique model um, it is fosters a lot of engagement with bidders. Um, so people get in on the ground floor, they get excited, they get attached. Um, and, you know, we are in the business of selling things. Um, we don't want to put forth all the effort into listing something online only to not have it not sell. Um, you know, it is a, it is a um, specific strategy for things that you really want to sell. If you don't want to sell it, if, unless you can get a certain amount of money out of it, have that conversation with me and we can see if your expectation is realistic. Um, because I don't want you to be unhappy with the value you get. And I can usually give you a pretty accurate estimate about what things are going to sell for. If it's possible, it sells for $10, I'll be honest with you and, and let you know that that's a possibility. Um, we sell everything with this model, starts at a dollar, um, $500,000 Rolex watches, cars. I mean, everything you saw at the beginning, all of that started at $1. Mm -hmm. We sold a Joseph Albers painting that closed at what, Wayne? We sold a, jo a Joseph Albers painting that uh, closed, I think at 185,000, but it started at a dollar. So we could all bid on it and feel like we had a piece of it. <laughs> the underbidders are very important. <laughs> um, and also that kind of goes back to the idea that at everything but the house, we do tend to hit fair market value on, on pretty much everything. So, I mean, that's a crot, like a general, in general we do. So some things are going to hit a little low and some things are going to go high, but you know, a $185,000 painting is not going to go for $5, you know? Something that's interesting about reserves too is that they sometimes can stifle, you know, if they, if the reserve is public or, you know, um, it kind of sets a perceived value, but I know for certain things, um, the, the seller would have set a, a, a reserve very low, but we went well beyond that reserve. And we might not have, if the reserve had been public, people would say, oh, it's only worth that much. When the sky is the limit, the sky is the limit. And, you know, the market really does set the price. We don't, we've talked about it, um, but it's not something that, I mean, the way that we operate, this model is so tried and true that, um, and it, it's a really good way to move the inventory. I mean, that's why you're using us is to move the inventory and you do need to be comfortable with accepting what the market is willing to pay for it. And I'm happy to give you an estimate. I do that all the time, but you do have to be comfortable and you do sign a contract that says, I'm giving you permission to sell this and there's no reserve and it's an absolute auction. What I would do is I would bring that whole collection in and have my stamp experts look at it because I know a little bit about stamps, but um, uh, you know, I know off the top of my head, these are for sure valuable and these are for sure not valuable, but there's a lot of gray area in between. And so we have people that research and that are stamp experts that do that all day long. And I would give it to them and they are going to separate it out. So they have a whole collection. They're going to lot things to try to sell for $150 or above. Um, that's where you and I both make the most money. So when things are selling at $150 or more, that's where we want to be. That's a good spot. And we're going to separate out groupings that are going to hit those values. Books um, are things that we get a lot and some of them are valuable and a lot of them are not. When I walk into a home, it's usually 
10% of their books we can sell. Um, just like your general New York Times bestsellers, novels, et cetera, um, are not very valuable, but certain antique books, certain decorative book sets um, can be very valuable. First editions signed by the author. Um, if you have first edition Harry Potter books, those are very valuable. So it, it's really case by case. Um, and we usually look at, um, like I'll take a picture of that cover page with all the information on it. Um, and I can use that with a couple different websites to kind of come up with a good value. Um, like native and Inuit art is uh, very successful with us. Um, I always check for ivory. Now I know we can sell walrus tusk as long as it was made and can be authenticated as made um, from like a native, um, you know, person. Um, but yeah, that'd be just a red flag to look for. Um, but yeah, that stuff is, is very successful with us. I would say with pieces like that also, if you have any provenance or if they're signed in any way, that that would also be, you know, help to add to the value of the pieces. Any other questions? We're gonna stick around. If you guys have specific pieces you brought in, you want us to look at, we're happy to do so. Um, definitely let me know if you would like to make an appointment for me to come look at your stuff, um, walk you through um, some evaluations of a few things, happy to meet, um, or you can just grab my card and text me anytime. Thank you.